Oops, I'm uh, sorry. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. It's good. It's good to see you all. Thank you. Let's wait uh, a few more minutes, maybe one or two more minutes. So interpreter Jesse is, uh, are you going to interpret uh, sign language, right? <laughs> All right, wow, that's great. There's, yeah, there's myself as one interpreter and Jan is the other interpreter. I see, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you for your support. Okay, I, I believe we can we can begin. Uh, let me start recording. Uh, all right. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Jeok Lee. You can just call me Jay. I'm assistant professor of new media art at the School of Art here in Northern Arizona University. Uh, today, I'm extremely pleased to to introduce uh, our first visiting lecture series presenters, John Lubin. Um, uh, before we begin our uh, John Lewis presentation, uh, first I like to uh, thank uh, uh, to uh, to the donors who made this event pos uh, possible through our NAU foundations. Also, I uh, uh, I um, I'm appreciate uh, the, all the efforts that uh, this uh, visiting lecture series uh, committee members uh, made. Uh, here we have uh, David Vannis and um, and Kate Byun. Uh, also, I uh, uh, I really appreciate uh, all the supports that the School of Art made uh, and 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 College of Arts and Letters, uh, who really helped us to promote this event. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you, Jack. And um, all right, here's John Lubin. John Lubin is uh, is. Um, uh, one of the leading artists uh, who is known for his uh, what we uh, what people call contextual practice. Uh, by which uh, I mean contextual practice, I mean uh, he used context as a, as a kind of artistic medium. Uh, so uh, uh, one of the examples is complication. He will explain. He used the context of the site and and, and the context of the place. As, 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 as a means to express his artistic interests. Um, he's been uh, uh, ex exhibited his work in a major uh, museums and art festivals, uh, such as uh, Guggenheim most recently, Guggenheim Museum in New York City, SF MoMA in San Francisco, Carnegie International, Leon Biennial. I mean, there's too many uh, important exhibitions he participated uh, to mention. Um, uh, also, he's also um, uh, a great educator. He's the director of the graduate program at the Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, since we, uh, NAU doesn't have a graduate uh, art program, and um, there might be some students who are interested in applying for a graduate program uh, at Carnegie Mellon, so it might be a good opportunity for if you have uh, any questions about a graduate program there as well. So, um, if, uh, so we're gonna begin John Lubin's presentations. Uh, so please everyone uh, mute yourself if you're not unmuted. And, um, and if you have any questions, we'll have a Q&A session probably at the end of the, the presentation but you can unmute yourself and ask question, but if you, uh, if available, please leave your question on this chat so I can, I can collect and, and, and read your question to, to John. Um, all right, uh, I'm, again, thank you very much for John Lubin to joining us and let's begin for, uh, Jai John, you can speak now. <laughs> thank you. Um, thanks, Jay. 
so it's a real honor to be able to join everyone in this kind of crazy situation. Um, I've done a couple of lectures over Zoom. Um, and uh, and I want to, uh, I'm going to actually have my presentation in kind of short segments. So I'll do maybe 10 minutes or so, and then I'm going to open it up for questions and I'll dive back in and open it up for questions. Just, you know, I know how hard it is. You've spent most of the day on Zoom zoning out. Um, so uh, I really enjoy any types of questions and Jay can moderate um, things in the comments or if folks want to raise hands and verbally, um, that's great as well. And so uh, maybe before I get to the presentation, just a brief introduction. Um, so yeah, so I guess like, I'm very interested. I went to um, how I went to the oldest art school in the United States, the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. So it's the most traditional old school um, based on the old French Beaux Arts model. I studied painting. Um, <clears throat> you know, I had a, a kind of like the kind of classic art training for someone who maybe lived a hundred years ago. So in other words, I, I felt like I went to an art school that was like lost in time. And, um, and it took me a long time to realize that what the material of art could be and where the place art could exist is far broader than the kind of confines of just museums and galleries or the default systems that I think the art world um, provides most students or frankly, the mythology we have about the art world constructs in most students' minds, very narrow range of things. And so um, I'm gonna talk about projects that for some of you might not necessarily look like art and sometimes they're definitely gonna look like art. I'm gonna really try to talk about them because I know a lot of you are art, you know, studying art in undergraduate in one degree or another. I'm really gonna try to talk to about them the way in which I would talk about any other, um, you know, work in terms of its material and its composition um, and the way in which um, meaning is made. But I'm also going to expand on sort of the nature of what those things are. And uh, so we'll dive into it and then open it up for questions. Um, so I'm going to share my screen, see how this all goes, optimize, and uh, okay, so Jay, we good? You can see everything. Now yes. you see nothing. Yes. Very good. Now you see. Okay. All right. So um, I'm going to talk primarily about just two projects. I've done a lot of different work, but I think it'd be nice to spend the time to kind of dig in maybe a little bit more deeply about two things. And then uh, I might have a bonus thing. And I definitely am very happy to talk to you about graduate school, which I am the graduate director here at Carnegie Mellon. University in the School of Art, and I know a lot about other programs as well, and can talk to you about that if you if you want to at the end. So really anything. So this is a project um, called Conflict Kitchen, and it started, uh, God, uh, almost ten years ago now, or nine or ten years ago, um, and it uh, it was it's a collaborative project that I started with artist Don Waleski, and um, it's. It originated in a neighborhood uh, called East Liberty in Pittsburgh. And the primary material I'd say that we were working with is a material that's super explicit right now for almost all of you. And that is xenophobia, right? The way in which we construct our identity as Americans and the way in which we construct that identity in opposition often to people outside of the United States, and more specifically to countries, cultures, and people who we might be at war with or in conflict with. And so um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna start actually by showing a little video that's almost like the, the most pulled out view. This is about four years into the project, and it's an extremely local project. Um, but it ended up having a kind of national and international resonance. And this is like a perspective of how a work that can be kind of intimate and small and 
personal can also get extrapolated into narratives that sometimes you're not even in control of as an artist. Um, so we'll watch this and then I'll give you the actual story of Conflict Kitchen. Let's see if... Uh... Die USA sind in viele Konflikte verwickelt, ob militärisch wie noch bis vor kurzem in Irak, als Schutzmacht für Israel im Nahen Osten oder ideologisch verfeindet, wie etwa mit Nordkorea, Venezuela oder Kuba. Diese Länder kennen viele Amerikaner nur als Bösewichte aus den Fernsehnachrichten. Das Takeaway-Restaurant Conflict Kitchen setzt da den Kochlöffel an und serviert wechselnde Menüs aus genau solchen Ländern. تجربة هو خلق جو مواتن لمناقشة ثقافات الشعوب وسياسة الخارجية الأمريكية. L'idea di attirare i clienti con del buon cibo per poi coinvolgere in eventi o dibattiti mirati a stimolare proprio la conoscenza della cultura e della politica di alcuni stati come per esempio l'Iran, l'Iraq, Cuba, Venezuela e la Corea del Nord. ويبدو أن فكرة المطعم تجاوزت ذلك بتوظيفها الطعام لإضاءة بصحة إنسانية على الحروب والنزاعات. So you order uh, Iranian food or Persian food anywhere from five to eight dollars, and they give it to you wrapped up in a wrapper that has conversations from people that are in that country. It features the opinions of Palestinians living on the West Bank and in the United States. Wenn seine Köstlichkeiten auspackt, dann erfährt man etwas über Afghanistan, zum Beispiel was ist die aktuelle Regierung oder was sind die Rechte der Frauen. Eine Art kulinarische Völkerverständigung. I think what they do is fantastic. They inform people about issues that are otherwise unknown in the United States. Viele Leute denken, die Afghanen sind Terroristen, vor allem nach den Anschlägen des 11. September. Aber unser Land entwickelt sich weiter und das ist toll, dass man das hier lernen kann. And, you know, the country is still thriving. Shabab al-Amerika b'shikl aam, shabab tayyib, shabab salamu b'hawad ashi ta'arraf ala ala ishi li mawjud fil-nizam ma bain al-Palestinian wa al-Tualiyin. Hari kan ilham fursa anam yishifu min tariqa tiyaniya gaira an al- Meine Mutter kommt aus Nordkorea. Ich finde es eine fantastische Idee, den Menschen hier dieses Land über das Essen näher zu bringen. So kann man mit Freunden und Kollegen gleichzeitig darüber reden, was dort passiert. Das ist toll. I think it's really important that the Coffee Kitchen has created a space where we can have an exchange of ideas. In a way, it inspires me to speak out more because I feel like I have to channel that fear that we we all have the collective fear and just channel it into positivity and show that we are united. So you, the basic premise of Conflict Kitchen is it's a restaurant that only serves food from countries that the United States is in conflict with on a rotating basis, essentially as a mechanism to um, enter stories into our community and, and experiences and um, realities that many people say in Pittsburgh might be completely unfamiliar with or uncomfortable knowing. Um, and so what is the material, you know, back to this question of what is the material? So on one level, the material, the main material of this project, I, I would suppose is food, but you could also say it's, it's a restaurant. It's the nature of a business and what we expect a business to do in our community. Um, so most businesses and certainly a lot of immigrant cultures, um, you know, sort of announce or present themselves to a community by opening restaurants, but that doesn't always happen. And certainly the politics behind anyone's culture aren't always explicit when they run a restaurant. So for us, this idea of a restaurant that seems very familiar, very common, everyone knows how to approach and, and spent their life going to restaurants. But then that sort of familiar discourse and understanding of a restaurant is turned a little bit on its head. So what is both a kind of seduction turns into a bait and switch. Um, a little bit of the process and then I'll talk about how that kind of bait and switch occurs. So a lot of what we do is travel. Um, fortunately, as the project developed, we were able to travel more and more. Here we are actually working with North Korean defectors in South Korea um, on a version of the project. Um, here we are in uh, Hebron in um, the occupied West Bank in Palestine and in Cuba. And so it's finding yourself in as many kitchens as possible, 
one of the beautiful things about recipes um, is they're essentially the original open source um, data, right? It's the, it's the information that, that everyone organically shares and it, it uh, bypasses uh, national borders and, you know, and ethnic differences. Obviously, there's sort of, there are specific cultural um, touch points and, um, and geographical, um, you know, uh, associate, you know, reasons for certain foods existing, but recipes, the way in which in a home people share and communicate information just bypasses anything that we might see as a sort of political or ideological impediment. And there's something that I learned when I was growing up. So I'm Jewish and, um, and Passover to me is a kind of perhaps an emblematic of the complex kitchen experience. So it's, it's the story meal for Jews. You know, it's, it's a meal in which every element um, that you're eating has a very specific narrative about the Jewish experience to tell you. And it's a very political one. You know, it's about uh, slavery and it's about um, freedom. And it's also one that is a social justice holiday, at least in my home. It's, it's one to look at your own culture's uh, persecution and then look beyond yourself at the persecution that others are experiencing. So that's kind of an interesting thing to happen in a family uh, meal or a, a cultural um, observation. And so, here we are, you know, in Hebron eating on the daily news and having this, you know, the food with its history related to the same types of politics or the, that were happening on a daily basis. And you can kind of look at the conditions that Palestinians are concerned about living in Israel. Um, and then also the celebration of a long um, and rich history and culture. So the challenge then is to bring that back to Pittsburgh or work more specifically with communities that are living in Pittsburgh from Palestine, Cuba, Venezuela, um, Iran. And so the project in many ways is collaborative. We open the restaurant, but every time we, we change identities, we work with the local community to, you know, to enact it. Um, so here we are, before we open the Venezuelan version of the project, um, having a meal with the Venezuelan local, some of the members of the local Venezuelan uh, community giving a taste test of the food. This is uh, the North Korean version of the facade. And then there's the most important, I suppose, back to the bait and switch, the, this mechanism of a kind of public performance where you're eating a food that, you know, maybe has never been in Pittsburgh. So we were the first Iranian, Cuban, Venezuelan, Afghan, um, North Korean, Haudenosaunee restaurant the city has ever seen. So the food's unfamiliar, but it, oh, that unfamiliarity opens up a question mark. And in that question mark, in that moment of curiosity, hopefully amongst the customer, is a space to fill. And in this case, to fill with the stories of the culture and people that this food originated from. So I want to take just a moment. I mean, there's been a kind of a lot that I've laid out so far. So Jay, I don't know if there's some questions or if folks have any questions and they want to put them into the chat at this point. Yeah, please leave a, uh, your question on chat. I can, I can collect and then ask uh, him a question for you, okay? All right. <laughs> How say uh, the Anthony asks, how do people react actually? How does the yeah? So, good question. I mean, very initially. There's you know this woman's face. I think explains a lot, right? There's like really like a kind of curiosity, and um, and depending of course on which version of the project, some people, um, you know, have absolutely no familiarity with the cuisine or culture or. Um, life of people in, in, say, Iran or Afghanistan outside of what they might have heard in the news, right? So um, a lot of folks who came initially were like, what is this thing, right? They had no idea what we were. And so we had to also explain this kind of larger premise. After running it every single day for seven years in Pittsburgh, people's I guess opinions and views started to shift. They started to recognize us 
They recognized what we were doing. They were explicitly seeking us out. Um, after a couple of years um, in the one location, we ended up moving into a really busy plaza because we felt we were becoming too comfortable. We were becoming too familiar. And we wanted to insert this project into the stream of daily life in a way in which someone would stumble upon it day after day after day, not knowing what it is, and then one day decide to come and seek it out rather than we're some destination or journey. There are actually several interesting questions. Uh, I think you can answer that as well. Uh, did you ever get a negative reaction? I'll, I'll read all the questions. And, um, and what's the name of the business it's called Conflict Kitchen? And um, who actually works at the counter? So uh, yeah. I think two more question. Good Negative question. question, then who works at the counter? So starting with who works at the counter is basically people in our community. Um, we're hiring people who both can work in a restaurant and then you know have a sort of geopolitical interest as well. So it was a pretty unique um, individual. And um, you know the type of person also, I think what we wanted was someone who had a kind of emotional intelligence. We didn't want someone necessarily to present themselves as an expert, but someone who you would feel incredibly comfortable talking to. And um, yes, of course there were negative viewpoints that people had depending, uh, you know, I mean, some people didn't like the food depending on what we're serving. Some people didn't like the, what they read as the politics behind the project. Some people, uh, felt that we should be presenting, you know, if we present a uh, Cuban viewpoint, we should be presenting the uh, American counter viewpoint. Um, and uh, so, and sometimes, you know, even like say in any given country, in Venezuela, there's a lot of debate about, you know, Chavist uh, socialism, right? No Venezuelan agrees on the same thing. And so um, when we would present that fact, some people, had a hard time because they had a very specific viewpoint of, say, the country. One, I'm going to sort of go through a couple of more things in terms of the project, and then we'll open it up for more questions. And it is called, it was, the business name was Conflict Kitchen. Um, so the food also became this point of distribution for these printed material, which is interviews with people who live in the country or expats from the country. Um, and we kind of started to develop a small publishing arm. So anyone who came up to the counter, there's a book of interviews with um, you know, kids from Cuba. Um, this is a speech that was written by Cubans um, that they wished Barack Obama would deliver to the American public. And then we hired the number one Barack Obama impersonator to deliver that speech on video. And while you waited for your Cuban food, there was this little video that would play. And so what you have, again, is a, is a very complex uh, speech of a kind of almost schizophrenic sounding Obama who's presenting the diversity of opinions that many different Cubans had. And again, it's a kind of seductive way of getting folks to pay attention to stories that they might not ever listen to. So I'll play a short clip of that. I actually forget the last time I had anything to say about Cuba, and I find that upsetting. We like to talk a lot about defending human sorry, rights. Sorry, does this have close but caption? But then we have trade and have close ties to China uh, and no, Vietnam sorry. and Russia. Just imagine if the United States had to exist for a week under the Cuban regime. We would eliminate so many American problems. I firmly believe that we should return Guantanamo Bay to Cuba. So that goes on for quite a long time. Um, the, you know, once we, once we moved to this new location, we were having around 400 people a day come to Conflict Kitchen. And so, you know, if you think about, say, a public sculpture, like this is kind of in the tradition of the, the public sculpture, except it defies the kind of static um, notion of a man on a horse representing a heroic moment in usually American white supremacist culture. What we were doing was trying to present that art actually is a constantly evolving and reconstructed narrative that is collaboratively happening between the audience 
in the context in which it exists, which is our city and the country and its, ac and its actions. So this is both a, a thing, an object in space, and a live performing collaboration. Um, this is a lunch hour. We would hold lunch hours usually once a month with different members of different communities that we were working with. This is a Sudanese community. There's a trivia show that would happen while you were waiting in line. The lines got so long, we tried to figure out how to utilize that space in some capacity. I mean, it's very much an educational project. This is during our Iranian version. If you were Iranian and you lived in Pittsburgh, you get free lunch. You just had to share it with someone from Pittsburgh. Um, this is a live Skype meal between Pittsburgh and Tehran. We started doing uh, lots of things online. So we just kept complicating for some way, for some reason, I don't know why, all the types of outreach and engagement we were doing. This is um, a human avatar. So we call this the foreigner. So Elise here who works in the kitchen is live connected to um, someone in another country and anything that person says she repeats. And the customer has a little microphone. So the person in the other country hears exactly um, what the customer is saying. So I'll give you an example. So here's Tracy on the right. She worked as a, a kind of avatar for us. And Mohammed, who is living in um, East Jerusalem, was um, the person who was live talking to the customers through Tracy. So um, unfortunately, it doesn't have captions. And also the Islamic State is is on the move. Uh, is that a threat to you or is that too far away? First of all, those are not Muslims. No. They're disguising themselves as Muslims, but they are mercenaries. Oh, okay. They are mercenaries. They're not doing the work for Allah. So what about you? I still, I still think you're young, I believe so. Yes. But what do you think about the future? Are you going to get married? Uh, a Middle East guy? Or someone from... Uh... I think my parents would want me to marry an Indian Muslim guy like myself. I believe that um, your parents are looking for a good future for you. You know, they're worried about you. And they want you to have a good life for you. Yes. But don't just take it easy with them. <laughs> okay. Because they're always thinking it and they're always caring about you. Thank you. <laughs> so um, Tracy actually went on to train uh, high school students in how to do this. And then we would connect the students with people we were working with in some of the countries that we were focusing on. So one of the interesting things is, you know, Tracy, she's local. She seems familiar, right? And yet she is uh, literally speaking the words of someone who is theoretically other or foreign and distant. And this collapsing and then pulling apart of um, kind of space and identity. You know, she's a woman, an Af you know, black woman who's representing a Arab man. Um, it kind of, for us, interestingly confronted all of the kind of biases and automatic reads that we put upon people. Um, what happens is that Tracy is an actress and she's amazing, is her empathy, her sort of humanity, allows Mohammed's humanity also to come through. And there's this sort of dual humanity that occurs. And in many ways, that's a kind of metaphor, I think, for the project, is recognizing that we are not, you know, North Korean or Venezuelan or Palestinian, um, but yet we can try to find this kind of humanity and experience inside ourselves in our own experience. Um, and then how do you share that is the larger question. Um, I'm not gonna sort of, this is a, something at the local Islamic center, an event we did um, with 300 people showing up, um, all who had never been to a mosque before in Pittsburgh. Um, this is the Palestinian version of the project. And um, let me just take a look at time. OK. So uh, this was probably the most uh, quote unquote controversial version of the project. But I would say that anyone who focuses on Palestine in the United States is going to come under some scrutiny and controversy. Um, 
just because of the nature of the ideological forces in the United States against a Palestinian narrative. Um, so when we opened it, uh, the Jewish Federation, which is a large national organization, started trying to attack the project both publicly and privately. So behind the scenes, they tried to get me fired. Um, in front of the scenes, they said that Jewish and Israeli students uh, feel incited by. Um, they started to speak to newspapers about our Palestinians focus criticizes one-sided, which is interesting. You know, our North Korean version was one-sided. Our Iranian version was one-sided. Why can't our Palestinian version be one-sided? Then newspapers in Israel started to carry that U.S. Jews were outraged over Pittsburgh restaurant's Palestinian menu. I happen to be one of those U.S. Jews, and I'm not outraged, so I think that's a pretty gross generalization. Um, then the Federation started to tweet at Sean Hannity, Fox News, to see if they'd bite on this story of, uh, you know, whatever the story they were kind of construct about us. And Fox News did. We received funding from the Heinz Endowments, Heinz Ketchup's Made in Pittsburgh. Teresa Heinz is married to the former Secretary of State at that time. And Fox News was writing these stories that the anti-Israeli restaurant receives funny from John Curry's wife. So this is a very Trumpian kind of, you know, bullshit, right? You could just make up anything, throw it out there. Um, interestingly, Breitbart picked up on the same thing. Now it's John Curry's wife funds radical anti-US, anti-Israeli eatery. So this is the kind of, you know, this is, you know, it's fine. This happens in the United States and this is part of the material of the project, right? It's not something I constructed, but it's something that's out there. Our stance was we'll keep our heads down, we'll do our work um, and we'll go from there. Um, not long after, B'nai Brith made a statement asking the Heinz Endowments to disavow their funding and the Heinz Endowments actually did. They disavowed funding us because of the Palestinian version of the project. And then we received a series of death threats and we had to close the kitchen, work with the FBI and the counterterrorism task force. And what became like, the sad right-wing, you know, BS turned into something that was actually much more uh, problematic, which is, you know, some crazy people out there using this as a means to try to close us and try to scare us. Um, after being in the community for every day for five years, people started to come out for rallies, not just for Conflict Kitchen, but for the Palestinian community in Pittsburgh. Think about if you were Palestinian living in the city and all you're hearing is all these news stories that basically devalue your, your life. So after around a week, we reopened and a lot of what was maybe not clear to people about why we existed, I think became extremely clear. And people would come to the restaurant specifically to support the vision that we had for counter narratives in the public space. Um, we did a Juneteenth version several years in a row, um, focusing on um, basically the, and it's obviously very clear now, but it's been clear forever to black folks, is the, the challenge that the black community has with the United States. And um, Juneteenth is, this is like six years ago and people really didn't think about or not many people knew about Juneteenth. So this is a great opportunity for us to work with the local African-American black community. Um, again, counter narratives, bring folks in who are owning restaurants in the, in the community and, and sort of to talk about the food, its history and its um, and contemporary life in Pittsburgh. We also had a focus on uh, the Haudenosaunee, which is the, the Iroquois Confederacy of Nations. So to look at our country's conflict still with people uh, of these nations. And uh, they're the, the closest sort of indigenous nation to Pittsburgh. And interestingly enough, the food felt very foreign for Pittsburghers, but a lot of this was really like the most local food that we served the entire time. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to just very quickly just say that after seven years, you know, the project had about 20 staff members. Um, it was a very complicated organization that started off as just a facade right on the side of a street, just a simple, simple premise that we just kept following 
over and over until it got more complicated and complex and rich um, through the sets of relationships that we built, not only with the people that we were working with um, outside the United States, but our community in Pittsburgh. And so it really became part of the fabric of daily life. And that's a kind of interesting idea of what a weaving is, right? Or what, um, how one material melds into another. This, it's in a more socially constructed way than just a um, pictorial way, but it's certainly the way in which we thought of the nature of the project. So why don't we stop there and Jay, maybe if, if folks have a couple of questions before I move on. Yeah, uh, there's uh, almost all, all the other questions already answered, uh, but one question that uh, uh, is, is, is the is the exterior design uh, is relevant to some uh, the specific cultures. Uh, the the oh, design. Yes. Yeah, we would definitely we the design. You know, um, this is a very pictorial in that regard, right? We wanted to really announce ourselves. This we don't want to hide in the public space. So the design is really important. This current design for this what you're looking at here was done by a uh, Muiz, who is a Palestinian uh, designer who's living in London. And he worked with our designer, Brett Yasko, who does all of the design for all of the versions. So it was very collaborative. Yeah, in each instance, the design is, is sort of culturally specific. Jay was helping us with some of the language, the Korean language stuff related to uh, the Korean version. Uh, okay, I think that's, uh, that's all questions we have. I mean, all the other questions you already answered, so. Okay. Good. I just want to answer questions, make sure they're all answered. So, okay, so I'm going to talk about a project that's very much related to Conflict Kitchen, but, uh, and actually came out of a friendship I developed before Conflict Kitchen with an artist, Sorab Kashani, who lives in Iran. He still lives in Iran. And this is a project that's actually in an art museum. It's the Mattress Factory Museum in Pittsburgh. So it's an art installation in Pittsburgh. And what you see on the left is Saurabh's apartment in Iran. Um, he lives actually across from the Russian embassy in Iran, a very nondescript apartment. He lives on the first floor. And an exact replica that we created of his apartment in the Mattress Factory Museum. And so the project is called The Other Apartment. And the premise that Saurabh and I had was, what if we bypassed all of the kind of political, geographical um, distancing, the sanctions, the travel bans, all the problems that we have that uh, prevent us from hanging out with each other and working together and moving money back and forth. What if we use that as um, almost a set of rules that we would abide by and find loopholes within? So the entire project is essentially a parallel reality. We constructed an exact version of, of Saurabh's life in order to create a place that can't exist in real life. So it's almost like a you know, notion, uh, like a quantum idea of uh, you know, parallel universes, and um, which perhaps split at a certain point and become different after their origin. And so that's another interesting uh, idea. So not only did we create the facade, but when you walk in the entire apartment, so this is a very, this is a project that involves sculpture, printmaking, um, painting, architecture, you name it. Um, so every object was either purchased or completely manufactured to duplicate every single possession that Sir Rob has. This is, uh, on the left-hand side will always be images of his actual apartment in Iran. And on the right-hand side is the duplicate in the mattress factory. So this is his bedroom. This is like his cabinet. So I had his cab, you know, so the entire thing, you know, he can't travel to the United States. So he all he could do is send me photographs of everything and dimensions and spreadsheets. So, oh, we worked a ton on Google Docs, right? He created a, uh, a folder for every object he owned. So it's a kind of crazy project. Here's some of the construction of the apartment. So we're looking at iPads that he's showing us pictures so that we can get as close as we can, um, replicating where things go, what they look like, sculpting them by hand, like this little crocodile or 3D printing things that he would scan, remaking the furniture, 
printing the books from scans that he made. So the absurdity of replication becomes this kind of, for us, this really poetic and empathic act, like paying deep, deep attention to something and someone. It's a portrait in its simplest form. It's a portrait of someone through the world they live in and the possessions they have. Um, so this is how he sent his rug to us. He took a photograph of it as high res as he could. He gave us the measurements and then I had them printed. I had the rug print the rug printed on a rug like material. So it's hard to tell that it's actually uh, fake. Um, this is a costume. He is a part time superhero called Super Surab. I'll talk about this in a second. This is his radiator, which we lovingly replicated out of wood. Um, this is the box where he keeps his weed. Um, so we recreated that. All of his books, he, he scanned. Um, what, so here's the thing is Sarab also runs an art space in his, out of his apartment. So we also ran an art space in our version of the apartment. The first project we did was um, we invited Iranian and American um, artists to show uh, video works. This, you can see the list, it's amazing folks who decided to, to do it. And then those were screened in uh, what we call the event room in his apartment. So on the left is in Iran and on the right is in Pittsburgh. We held the openings in the same day. It's eight and a half hours later in Iran, so it couldn't be exactly the same time. This is the opening in Iran and the opening in Pittsburgh. Um, Another project we did, another sort of exhibition. One day, this cassette tape showed up, and I know every object in this apartment. And I was like, where did this cassette tape come from? And apparently, someone left it there to kind of promote his band. So it's this guy who lives in Mexico City, and he thought it was a good idea to leave his cassette um, as a way to like maybe promote his band. And Sarab and I were like, oh, this is amazing. This is such a beautiful thing. Uh, so, and everything's very handmade and DIY. Um, so I found his like social media account. I looked him up and then Saurabh immediately made a replica of the cassette tape uh, in Iran. And we created an exhibition based entirely on this cassette tape. So we asked musicians in both uh, Pittsburgh and Tehran to cover every single song on this cassette. So essentially take this guy's dream maybe and just like amplify it. So I'm going to, I think I have an audio. Okay, so you get the sense of the music, right? It's just him in a room making it happen. So what's really fascinating is it's a guy from Mexico City who's left a tape in Pittsburgh version of an Iranian apartment. There's like already this three cultural transformation going on. So what we did is we, we asked bands to write cover songs and then come into the apartment and, and perform them. So in the top is the Iranian version, Iranian band, and in the bottom is an American band. And you see that in each, in each room. And then each room, um, the videos would be presented. So I have a short clip here. <laughs> So that sounds quite different than his song. It's a really beautiful interpretation by Inez. So the videos then play in the exhibition in all the different rooms in which they were performed. In the bathroom. And then we made new, ver new cassettes with the covers that people could purchase. Um, so very briefly, and I have just two, two more parts of this and I'm gonna pull out. So we were going to, before COVID, invite these, these are twins. They're Iranians. Um, we were going to invite one of them to do a residency in Iran and one to do a residency in the apartment in Pittsburgh. And it was all set up and there it was just this beautiful idea of like twins doing residency in two places that look the same in different cities. And then COVID hit. So 
The last project we just opened two days ago is called Where Shall We Go Today? So I told you that Surab is this, uh, he has this alter ego. And it's essentially, his mom made the costume. It allows him to cope with daily life in Iran, which is quite difficult. So he puts it on to deal with like, filling out his visa form, um, ironing his clothes, uh, dealing with anxiety. And so, and Saurabh and I are very close. I've gone to Iran and visited him. Years ago, he came and visited me. And he's really suffering in Iran right now. Um, his space cannot be open to the public because of just the conditions there. The mattress factory is open again. So we thought, we have this public space. Let's invite people in to the mattress factory to visit with Saurabh, Super Saurabh, and, and give him sort of forms of resilience. And so what you'll see is um, a therapist, a Tai Chi master, uh, an opera singer, and a hip hop dancer came on different days uh, to meet with Saurabh. And so playing in the living room now of the apartment is the video documentation. And I'll give you a very short clip. It's very quick, so just be ready for it. Um, but the actual video lasts, it's about like a you know, 20 minute video that is presented. Okay, get ready, it's gonna go fast. I have OCD, Joseph. Kind of like a I'm figuring out who I am and my identity. <laughs> So the project really is about daily life, right? A lot of my work deals with just the way in which we try to get through the day and make meaning. And, um, you know, this is not like art in, the, in like that I made it up out of scratch. It's just life represented. You know, it's actually quite simple in that regard. The script is already out there in the world. I don't have to write anything. Um, Surab's life and, and my life and our relationship and our lack of um, capacity to work together is the reality that is the fundamental material. So um, this project, uh, you know, I like to some to talk about the budgets. This is a sixty thousand dollar project, so it was a very expensive project to produce, um, and a staff of people that took four months to uh, construct. And my fee for the whole project was probably about five thousand dollars. So I could not make a living if I, I would have to do. Uh, <laughs> I would have to do 20 of these a year, you know, to make a living. So also note that about the nature of being an artist. Uh, lastly, I teach at this fine university that, that produced your wonderful Jaywalk. Um, well, he, he produced himself, but we were there for part of the journey. And, um, and I could talk a little bit about, you know, graduate school and things like that. So I'm going to pull out Jay. Okay. Uh, thank you. I yeah. can. I can't. My cursor is completely gone and visible. Um, can you un get me out of this? For stop sharing, so I can. Okay. Oh, here we go. Yeah. Great. <laughs> Yeah, so any questions on any of that? I have a bonus project as well, but I don't know. I think we're, we might be short on time. Uh, I had a question about the replication of the apartment from Tehran. Um, hi, by the way, my name is Neil Galloway. I'm a professor at NAU. Oh, well. Um, and I'm pleased to say there's a lot of my students here. So thanks guys for coming. Uh, my question is about the replication process, which seemed like unbelievably thorough and tedious. Was there ever a point where you got like halfway or two thirds and went like, we got in too far guys. <laughs> like we bit off more than we can chew. I'm wondering if that ever occurred to you or how you yeah. got through it if it didn't happen. 
We had to, that's a great question because I think, yeah, at a certain point you're like, what are we going to be able to achieve? Like we could, you could get so anal about a cigarette packet, right? So are we going to make the cigarettes? Are we just going to make the packet? And so I was constantly doing a time calculation in my head and I had folks working for me, so I'm not making it all, but I'm like, just make the packet. It's going to be fine. We're not going to make the cigarettes. And then other things I'm like, let's, deeply slowly pay attention to it i mean to be honest it's it's hard to see but the walls are he lives in a stuccoed cement house you know we have a dry we constructed ours with drywall so we spent a lot of time just getting the the kind of curves of every corner you know that's sort of the the nature of the feel the flooring we made by hand he has terrazzo and cement floors and we really spent a lot of time painting and replicating that to to make it really visceral. And so, but then other things were like, we could buy that. Let's just buy that. We don't need to replicate that. Um, yeah. What will you do with the stuff, the completion of the project? We're actually looking for other venues for the project. We're talking to some other museums. A lot, a lot of museums have gone black. You know, the whole premise of this was actually, we were gonna make a sitcom together that happened in the same apartment. So I think the next version we would love to do is produce the apartment as a series of stage sets and then produce a sitcom where the same characters are living in both um, versions. And so I, that was my kind of dream for where it might go. Maybe something else would happen. Um, so undergrad students are sometimes involved in the project. It's actually graduate students I had two graduate students who were my main, I had one who did a lot of the sculpture that you saw, um, Max Spitzer, and Erin Millay, who Jay knows, I think, did a lot of the 2D um, replication. Occasionally, I do hire undergrads to work on stuff. The, uh, the Conflict Kitchen was mostly just folks from the city, but we had a couple of people from, from Pittsburgh. Yeah, a couple of students, rather. Um, I'm looking at some of your comments here. Foods that are sustainable, there's no social justice without environmental justice. It's a really, this question related to conflict kitchen and, um, you know, I think what we definitely try to source our ingredients as locally as possible. Um, there are certain ingredients we had to import or you know, ship or even had people send from the countries we were working with. Um, we bought the entire um, production of olive oil from a farm in Palestine, um, both as a support for the farmer, but as a way of really giving that specific flavor. Um, obviously, that's not local, but um, that felt really important. So, yeah, dealing with that is, is always kind of different. Um, there won't be another location in the U.S. right now. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm just looking at some of your comments. What projects are ahead of me? I don't know. I'm in a strange, like, open space. If you got any ideas, um, right before, I was in a kind of weird, like, right before COVID, my plate was open and that felt great for the first time in many, many years. And now it feels awful. <laughs> I'm like, like I'm ready to dive in. I'm sure it's something else. I think if yeah, it feels awful, Astrid. It feels awful for everyone. This is a tough time to make art. This is obviously a tough time to be in school and a tough time to motivate. I think shrinking and getting small and, and thinking about what you can do in kind of a more intimate environment um, and letting yourself off the hook a little bit, you know, like. It's okay to be suffering. I've got a lot of anxiety right now and I could pin it to a lot of things, but you know, it, it's hard. And I think working with Saurabh, you know, that the whole project we did with him was really about coping with anxiety. He has OCD and he suffers from anxiety. And um, you know, that's a very real thing. And I think the superhero is, is that like mechanism, but also for us just friendship is like a mechanism to, to cope. 
And if art can construct friendship at any point, that's like a bonus, of course. Um, I collaborate a lot on my works. And so whether I'm collaborating with other artists or other individuals, and I also, I just put this out there. I think often of my art as an excuse to have like a richer, more interesting life than I would have without the excuse. I think it's like the superhero costume, right? It's the excuse to sort of um, take on an identity or an alter ego or be bolder. Um, it's in you. Like Saurabh always says like, I am that superhero. I'm a superhero. It's part of me, but without the costume, it's invisible, maybe even invisible to him. And I think, you know, regardless of the type of work you make, it's, it's kind of like um, courage potion. It's a courage potion, you know, in the best ways. Uh, and that's, that's what I think keeps me doing it. Because I, I get paid by being a teacher. I barely make any money by being an artist. And I'm pretty successful. You know, I'd be like done okay. But the type of stuff I do, I don't sell any of it. Um, but I, what, I, what I get fed by is um, the worlds that it allows me to participate in, right? I feel just more connected through the work. Um, and so that's, I think, allowed me to kind of keep doing it, I don't know, 30 years after getting out of school or whatever. Series about how many visuals you use. Uh, I met Sarab. It's a good question. Um, I did a project where I tried to track. Well, this isn't really how physics work, but I tried to track the sun at noon around the Earth. Really, it's a, the spinning of the Earth. But regardless, I tried to find. I found someone in every time zone to basically project the sun at noon in their time zone to me for one day. And I, I knew someone else in Iran and they were like, oh, this young guy, Sarab, he would stand on his roof with a camera or a Skype and Skype to you. So I met him then and then um, we just stayed in touch. I did a project called Never Been to Tehran with him and a bunch of really conflict kitchen came out of my relationship with him. We were saying, this happens every couple of years. We're like, we're going to war with Iran which is easy for us to say. And he was like, holy fuck. Sorry for cursing. He's like, they're going to war with me, right? And so, you know, he was my immediate entry into the opposite side of that equation of like, yeah, the United States goes to war with people. Like, that's real. For us, sometimes it feels like it's a possible, it's an abstraction. And so a lot of, you know, Conflict Kitchen was like, we go to war with cultures and countries we know nothing about, right? If you look at the, the uh, Afghan papers that came out, it's filled with generals talking about the fact that they know nothing about Afghanistan. Um, you look at the Pentagon papers and what we didn't know about Vietnam, etc. So the danger of ignorance, and that came out of, to be honest, what Saurabh sort of showed me through our friendship. Um, Jay, do, how are you? I, I want to just respect your you're time good. and your time. Yeah, you're, you're good, I think. You can little go over a little more than an hour, definitely. Okay. So, how do you create these collaborations internationally? They're not, they're, you know, we're all kind of connected. You just have to meet one person. You might know someone who's like in your own school, right? Who's, you probably can very easily find someone that, at your school who's from almost anywhere. And they're the entry point. Again, it's back to that idea of like art as the excuse or entry point into a world larger than the one you occupy. Other people are the same thing, right? And so for me, it's like, you know, I mean, the beauty, the thing I love about like teaching is like, you know, I meet Jay, Jay is an entry point to me, or was an entry point into so many different experiences that he has and perspectives. Um, and then you just follow that, right? And you meet another person and another person, all of a sudden you're sitting in a country and, you know, surrounded by folks. Um, yeah, I sometimes work with folks from other faculty 
Um, I've co-taught classes with design, with drama, um, architecture. Uh, it's, it's hard, you have to kind of initiate it here. Um, they talk about, you know, Carnegie Mellon Research University and collaboration, but everyone's in their silos. And um, Brett Yasko, who did all the design for Conflict Kitchen, and almost all the projects I've done, is now a design faculty here. And so we co-taught a class and, um, yeah. Anybody have a question about graduate school or? You can uh, explain. Uh, yeah, I could talk a little bit about our program. And so we're very interdisciplinary. I think Jay's a, a like beautiful example of that. Someone who is like a polymath. I mean, him specifically, who whose interests are from you know physics to art to sculpture um, to social engagement uh, to performance to video to curating. That's the kind of not that you need that many facets. But usually more than one facet is the type of student that does well here. We're a three-year program. It's all, we only accept six students a year. And so it's 18 students total. We have an amazing brand new building. It's almost fully funded, not entirely. Um, and we're in a you know, great research university. It's, because it's three years, most programs are two. There's a lot of time to get lost in a good way. And there's a lot of time to kind of dig in on research. Um, uh, not everyone does that. Some people work kind of intuitively, but you know, there's a lot of writing involved in the program where you, know, you might go to Yale in the painting department and knock out your paintings and that's great. Um, and they're gonna, you know, there's certainly other programs that are gonna fast track into the art gallery market system. I think we're less geared towards that. A lot of folks like Jay go into teaching um, who come here, but also go into lots of other fields. We really like folks who've taken a couple years off of undergrad. I would say this to everyone by and large, even if someone accepts you right out of undergrad, take a couple years off. Like get the institution out of your system get the defaults of like everyone's paying attention to what I do because I'm in class, like get out in the world and, and make people pay attention and see how they do and how they don't and see how you create community, or what the community you, you struggle and strive for and need come with urgency. I always ask what's the urgency and that could be many things for different um, artists. And, um, yeah, and I think you can only have that by, frankly, leaving, leaving school and, and trying it out. And whatever, waiting tables and, or, you know, programming websites or whatever it is to, you know, do gig work. Because guess what? The life of an artist is a life of a gig worker. You are kidding yourself if you think that it's just, it's purely just painting or purely, purely just making the work. You're doing gig, you're doing work. Every, almost everyone. Obviously, there's some folks who kind of got, you know, just run in their studios, but 99% of the people I know, and I probably say almost everyone probably sit in this room, is gig working. Teaching to me is a gig work. I mean, it's great work. But note, note that that's going to be part of the reality. And so have a little experience doing that, right? So you don't get just sort of thrown into a universe outside of school, 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 and then you're like, All right. Um, do you guys have any other questions? Uh, you can speak if you want or type. I had a question actually. Uh, I am a uh, I'm Kate Bian in Interdesign program, and I have a several students showed up from the Interdesign program. And it seems like you did a lot of work in a space and place like a kitchen, an apartment, three dimensional space and places. I was curious how could you come up with a certain three dimensional art installation and space planning? Like, yeah, it's funny. Um, I'm really bad at like sculpture. <laughs> I'm not, that's not the way in which my brain works so much, even three dimensionally. And uh, like, to be honest, I'm not very good at any one thing. I consider myself like a kind of professional amateur. And so 
what I think I, maybe what my skill is, um, is in organizing people who are good mm-hmm. and thinking about, um, you know, kind of more like maybe a movie director. I mean, some movie directors are probably quite good at certain things, but um, so I'd say, yeah, that's the way, I know what I, I know my limitations and I'm totally fine with them, mm-hmm. but I also know what I want to achieve. Mm-hmm. And so I seek out the resources outside of myself to get to where I need to be. And I think that breaks the mythology of the way the artist should be working is only like me alone, the master, dependent on only my own skill set and, and genius in, in a solo box, producing little things of mm-hmm. like miracle. Mm-hmm. And that's like, I have the opposite view. Like the way in which I move through society is I have relationships with people and um, I, I'm fully dependent. And so I think that's for me. Gotcha. And also the, for the uh, complex kitchen, I saw the several design based on the different culture. You mentioned that the one from the British designer or someone else, but do you have a certain concept to come up with the branded environment of kitchen with a different logo, different patterns and also design? Do you have certain ideas to direct them? Yeah, I mean, we have the limitations of the facade. Mm-hmm. You know, it had just whatever its architecture is and where we can put something. Mm-hmm. And then we have the limitations of this sort of like food wrappers. <laughs> so, like literally, like here's a square. We need a pattern. We want something mm-hmm. that repeats. So almost every culture deals with pattern in one way or another, which is really like just the same way every culture deals with dumplings in one way or another or, um, you know, or like some type of pasta. So that yeah there were sort of like restrictions that we would have that they could that we could work within Mm -hmm. Um, but within that it could be pretty playful as well Mm -hmm. and then yeah thank you welcome i have a website the question is just johnrubin.net so if you want to see other projects they're up there there you go it's a pretty simple website, <laughs> Squarespace. All right. Um, okay. Um, thank you very much, John. Uh, if I have more questions, I'll definitely forward this to you. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, it's, it's been great, and I'm really honored to be able to speak to everyone. We, we enjoyed a lot. I enjoyed a lot. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Bye.